Ladies and gentlemen, we are now beginning the third session. Please welcome Professor Stephen Hicks. Okay. I'm realizing as time goes on that there's a four session day, but uh, the only material we have is for five sessions. So <laughs> we'll get out of here at 9 p.m. All right. <laughs> Uh, last time we were talking uh, human nature and the arguments, uh, modern, pre-modern and post-modern about human nature, and then some of the value and social political implications that come out of that. I want now to turn to some of the epistemological issues, uh, episteme being the Greek word for knowledge, right, kind of an informed knowledge and a reflection on when do we know or not know. Obviously, we have a very powerful, this is the modern claim, cognitive capacity, uh, but it's a capacity that needs to be exercised and learned and it can be fallibly used. And so all of the procedures need to be specified and checks and double checks in place. But we also know that uh, despite all of that, we can believe things that are false, that are silly. We can engage in wishful thinking. We may or may not have inbuilt psychological biases in place. Uh, and sometimes we are subject, as we know in, from the previous session, to pressures to conform either to authoritarian beliefs or beliefs that lots of people we want to hang out with uh, happen to believe. So under what circumstances do we really know? Uh, is everything probabilistic? Uh, is there a difference between something that's a speculation and something that's a possibility and something that's a probability? or perhaps in a court of law that can be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, if so, what's a reasonable doubt as opposed to an unreasonable doubt? And can we ever be certain the ultimate gold standard with respect to knowledge? So long-standing philosophical claims are especially important for us as human beings because we are not plants that just grow automatically and do what we need to do to survive nor are we uh, animals that may have uh, uh, instincts and automatic forms of knowledge and a minimal amount of learning. Now, if you think about it, uh, you know, full-grown kitten, sorry, uh, not a full-grown kitten, but how long it takes for a kitten to be full-grown. Say it's born in the spring, it can come to adulthood in a few life and a few months and basically be on its own and it knows everything that it needs in order to survive as a full-grown cat. Dogs might be a little bit longer, chimpanzees, it might be a few years, say three or four years until the chimpanzee is mature and it knows what it needs to know uh, to function as a chimpanzee. But then we think about our three-year-olds, right? our four-year-olds, right? the amount of learning and the development, not only of their physical capacities, but their cognitive capacities until they are ready to leave mom and dad and go out into the world and make a go of it and be able to uh, make all of those difficult judgment calls and experiment and try new things and stick it for the long term. That's a huge, huge project. So philosophy, in terms of how it makes decisions about what human cognition amounts to, what the proper methods are, uh, uh, is an important foundational discipline and it has uh, huge implications. As we know, the postmoderns end up being in a rather skeptical position and basically all of the knowledge claims you make the listed, all of the method claims, they will say no, 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 all the way down. And so we do end up in a fairly strong form of skepticism. But before we turn to their critique, I want to uh, revisit some of the standard debates over where knowledge comes from. And there is, again, a pre-modern versus a modern take. That's a fairly high level flying over the territory distinction, but it's, a, it's an important one and one that uh, all of us, I'm sure, have engaged with at some point. So if we're going to say that we know things, we know reality, the question is going to be downstream from the question of what we take reality to be. So do we think that knowledge is a matter of coming to know, right? that the object of our knowledge is the natural world, the physical world out there? And if so, the question will be, what capacities do we have for connecting with the natural physical material, however we describe that world. And then typically we say things like, if we are born healthy, we have five senses that are our points of contact, information comes in, and then we can start the cognitive process by observation of the natural world. 
But if we are uh, of a, a, a religious nature, we're more likely than to say metaphysically, reality is not primarily the natural world, but derivatively, uh, it comes from a supernatural world. I mean, perhaps the world was brought into existence by a higher power. It was given form. It was given direction. And so knowledge is of the higher world, that uh, when we know the natural world, we're knowing a secondary world or a derivative world. And if we're really ambitious, we want to know the highest of all high. We want to know the mind of God, for example. Now, this is a longstanding debate right, in Western tradition, uh, not only metaphysically, right, is there a supernatural dimension in addition to the natural dimension, or are we and should we be naturalistic? But the epistemological uh, 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 correlate of that is important. One of the great stories and meditations that is still enormous amounts of ink and anguish being spilled all down into the 21st century is the story of Abraham and Isaac right, from Old Testament or Hebrew scriptures. And I want to uh, just ask us to reflect on this story in very uh, focused form for a few minutes because it's pregnant in its implications. So the story is Abraham and his wife Sarah right, are childless. They are getting on in years and Abraham is despairing that he and his wife Sarah will have issue that will then carry on the line. And it's thought that Sarah, his wife, is barren. Uh, so we, ask, we ask, well, why do we assume it's the female's fault? And the reason was that Abraham had fathered a child through one of his slave women, Hagar. So it was known that he was fertile, but somehow the connection wasn't working with him and Sarah. Uh, <clears throat> an angel visits Abraham and says, you and your wife Sarah will give birth to a child. It will be a male child, and through this child, the future generations of Israel will arise, and you will be the founder of a mighty nation. Abraham, a little skeptical at this point. You know, we're getting up there. My wife is getting up there. Right? Uh, but he is a faithful man, and so he doesn't push his skepticism too hard. Sure enough, Sarah gets pregnant. She gives birth to a son. They name him Isaac. And then we fast forward a decade, 15 years or so, Isaac is now a youth. The angel comes back, says to Abraham, God has a new command for you. I want you to take your son Isaac to the top of Mount Moriah, a place where sacrifices were tra traditionally performed to God, and to offer him as a sacrifice to God. So, Put yourself in Abraham's shoes. And this is the first question for the session. What do you do? And write it down. Now, you might expect answers will vary right, on this. And the biblical story fast forwards right, to the next morning when Abraham gets up, calls his son, right, gathers all the necessary equipment, takes his son up to Mount Moriah, and lays his son on the altar takes the knife, raises it, and commits to killing his son. Now, that's an interesting moment, the commitment moment. He's willing to do it. Why? Now, you might say, this is where the reflections from theologians and philosophers on this over the centuries say, <clears throat> That this makes no sense. So what you would do is, why? Why God? Why do you want me to do this? And that's to ask a question. 
But then, of course, to ask a question of God is to question God. Explain yourself, God. So it's important that Abraham did not question. Now, presumably, inside of Abraham, there are things that are going on. This makes no sense. <clears throat> I'm killing an innocent human being. Isaac, I'm sure he's done the little things that boys do, but nothing that deserves the death penalty. And my moral development, my rationality tells me, you don't kill innocent people. That's wrong. But he doesn't ask God what justifies the killing of an innocent human being. You might say, this seems a little bit promise-breaking, because after all, before Abraham was conceived, you said that through my son Isaac, future generations of Israel would arise. Did you change your mind? Were you lying? Did you forget? In which case, if any of those things are true, why should I listen to you and follow through on this command? It doesn't seem it doesn't make sense. And of course, you might say, this seems rather sadistic. I mean, you're asking me to kill, that's one thing, but not just anyone. You're asking me to kill my own son? And those of you who are parents will understand this. What is the worst thing you can imagine happening as a parent? Loss of your child. And not only the loss of your child, but the loss of your child at your hand. Nothing could be worse than that. And then, of course, you're asking me to do this and then go home to my wife, Sarah. <laughs> How did your day go, dear? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, okay. No, I'm going to inflict enormous cruelty upon her as well. So why? Why? Is this the right thing to do? And is it even the right thing to do? Now, as the story goes on, Abraham does not ask any of those questions. He takes Isaac to the mountain, lays him down, and he commits. And at the last split second before the knife can kill Isaac, the angel returns, stops his hand. Isaac is spared. And there's a moral of the story. And what is the moral of the story? Abraham passed the test. He is a hero in this tradition because he passed the test. But what was the test? And it was a test of faith. That's the word. He is a knight of faith. He is a hero of faith. And what faith then means in this tradition is to say, yes, you as an individual have your own mind and your own understanding of what's right and wrong and what you should do, and you remember various promises that were made. But a person of faith is going to believe in a higher power, even if it does not comport with his or her individual understanding. Abraham was willing to not ask, not raise, not challenge any questions that he might have had for the higher authority. He obeyed without question. That's faith. Now, I'm giving a very strong interpretation right, of the Abraham story, and there are softer interpretations right, over the course of the centuries, but that has been the mainstream. If you have some kind of fancy, rational way of figuring out, no, 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 Abraham was doing the right thing, and here's my explanation, the point is going to be, well, that's to miss the point. Because if it's a rational, sensible thing to do, then you don't need faith for it. You can explain what you're doing. But in this case, you're committing to something you don't understand, and even in cases where it seems opposed to your reasoning. Now, what we then then have is an epistemological stance that says, if you are going to know the highest truths, the highest truths are not necessarily going to be unintelligible to you, but you have to believe them on the basis of faith. As the tradition goes on, there will be authorized interpreters of the faith, those who are inheritors of the faith, faith will extend to them. 
And so a faithful person follows the tradition as it comes down. Now, this is precisely, of course, what the moderns were starting to challenge, to say, from their perspective, you start to see, interestingly, in the 1400s, 1500s, and 1600s, an increasing number of intellectuals willing to say things like, Abraham is a moral monster. What is the mark of someone not having a moral compass? not being willing to rely on your own conscience and your own judgment and to do things that you are satisfied in your own mind are the right thing to do, rather to turn off your intellectual independence and follow higher authority. And that claim then in the early modern period is then that this is, is a, not only an epistemological sin, Abraham did not know what he was doing was correct, but also he should have known better and in fact, he was acting immorally by abdicating that fundamental responsibility that all individuals have, which is to think and act on the basis of their best independent judgment. Now, the mature competitor version to that, actually the slide is a little bit out of focus right on that one, is then to say, to the extent that we operate on a different epistemology, we say individuals need to be convinced by the exercise of their own independent judgment. What that will mean is you start to challenge all of the so-called authoritative beliefs that have been collected over the course of the centuries, all of the authoritative institutions, whether they are religious, political, or whatever, uh, all of the books that are revered, everything will be put to the test and a matter of your own individual judgment. Now in religious form, there's a religious form of this, this is uh, the scientific method, but the religious form of the Protestant Revolution, Reformation is in part a epistemological revolution. So if you think of the insistence that the Protestants had on, if you want to come to know the mind of God, you can't do it indirectly. You can't just uh, go through what the priest is saying on Sunday morning, and the priest has received it, uh, the interpretation from the archbishops, and the archbishops have received it from the cardinals, and the cardinals received it from the pope, and there's this long tradition of smart people that stand between you and coming to know God. The Protestants were wanting to argue, no, individuals have their own minds, they have their own souls, and the important thing is for each of us as individuals to become convinced in our minds about what the right view of religion is and what God wants for us. From, from their perspective then, this is one of the great epistemological battles of the 1500s is precisely this individual judgment versus a collectivized and authoritative judgment. So the Protestants wanted to argue that what we need to do is teach everybody to read right? so that everybody can read scripture for themselves and make up their own mind. Uh, but of course, if you're going to teach everyone to read, that's a very ambitious project. And at that point, scripture was available pretty much only in Latin. The vast majority of the population was literate uh, to a very minor degree or outright illiterate. So the idea would be if you want to teach people to become literate, first you're going to teach them their own language, their vernacular, then maybe if they're more educated, we can teach them Latin. But So the Protestants wanted to embark upon a massive project of taking the Bible and translating it into all of the vernacular languages precisely so that everybody could read scripture for themselves and figure out what it means for their own individual mind. So it's an individual movement, and this is highly resisted right, by the more institutionalized for now over a millennium right, church that has said we have a monopoly on proper interpretation of scripture, right? to the point where translators and publishers of, it's hard for us to imagine now, the Bible in English or the Bible in German, they would be uh, hounded and hunted down by the Inquisition and persecuted. So King Henry VIII, uh, of course, he's famous for you know, the, you know, the, the greatest soap opera ever in political history, right? six wives and all of the religion and politics and everything intermixed there. But before, when he was still a good Catholic and called by the Pope uh, Defender of the Faith, a great honorific title, there had been early reformers in England, William Tyndall being one of them who wanted to produce an English version of the Bible, and uh, when King Henry's men found out about this, right, Tyndall had to flee to the continent. 
Uh, and he obviously couldn't get it published initially in England. He had it printed on the continent and copies were being smuggled into England. But then for eight years, King Henry's men hunted for William Tyndall. This is a big deal. They finally found him and uh, ended up executing him for, uh, for this, this inappropriate right, behavior. So the stakes are high. So 1500s and we have this movement toward the individuality and the importance of individual judgment. Now, of course, the Protestants are involved in unintended consequences here. They end up believing that you have to have absolute faith in scripture, but it's got to be your own individual mind that does so. And so once you do start to translate the Bible into the languages, you do teach people how to read. They start to read. They start to interpret it for themselves. But what happens when any of us get together? Yeah, you know, we started to do this a little bit just <laughs> before the lunch break. We all read the same passages, and there's however many people of us in this room. How many different interpretations are we going to have of that one passage? Right? Well, lots. But who's the ultimate authority here? And the answer is going to be each of us individually is our own ultimate authority. And that needs to be respected, which is why then Protestants are constantly breaking off into new churches and starting new churches. You have the wrong thing. It is your viewpoint. You know, I think probably you're going to burn in hell because you have the wrong interpretation. But nonetheless, I have to respect your right to go your way on religious matters. And I'm going to go my own way on religious matters. Catholics, by contrast, want to keep things in the family, in the group, much more. So at the same time, we have then the early scientists. And while the Protestant Reformation is going on, this is now in the 1500s, Copernicus is publishing and uh, in the year of his death, 1543, the heliocentric model and the earliest scientists are coming along and saying, look, we really want to figure out the way the world works. How do we do that? Well, we actually have to observe the heavens and keep data and put the data in tables and do some mathematics and do calculations and check the calculations and our projected hypotheses on the basis of those against further observations and so on. And we'll have big arguments and debates about what all of this means. That's how we're going to figure out the way the world really works. So out of the 1500s, this early modern, both for religious reasons and for scientific reasons, there is a greater respect for rationality, for independence of judgment and individuality. Now, scientific method, as we call it, is, uh, and you probably can't read that, unfortunately. It's a very sophisticated working out, and all of these elements uh, involve lots of working out by philosophers and scientists working uh, hand in hand with each other. But observing the world, classifying the data on the basis of that, coming up with a hypothesis that's going to explain, you think, the data, being able to generate a prediction that will reliably uh, speak one way or another to the hypothesis to come up with the experiment that's actually going to yield you the data that enables you to test the hypothesis, to take the, the data of the experiment and then have the logical and the mathematical tools to see whether it confirms or denies the hypothesis. If it's a failure, then going back and starting the process all over again. If it's successful, then and making a difficult judgment call. Do we need to do further experiments? What's our degree of confidence and how decisive or not this experimental result was? How does this experimental result and this confirmed hypothesis fit with the other hypotheses that we have? How can we apply this in terms of practical consequences and so on? So all of this then gets worked out. But we still have all through the modern world a debate over whether fundamentally Knowledge is a matter of faith in higher authority or whether it's something that individuals need to work out for themselves. And we find that debate going on within religious circles and, of course, across the divide between those who want to say religion is not up to snuff in the modern world. Uh, we have to go the scientific direction. Now, to the extent that this methodology starts to become important, you start to find in the early modern world also great debates over whether religion is something that should be a rational enterprise or a faithful enterprise. And as the scientific project arises, 
we find what we call the heyday in the early modern world of all of the great debates over the existence of God. And it becomes a matter of life and death epistemological importance to be able to say, if human beings are rational, and we understand that the world was made by God, then what we should be able to do is look at the world the way scientists do on the basis of our observations of the world and our best interpretations of the world show. Just as scientists want to prove this, that, and the other thing, prove that there is a God who created the world and gave order to the world. So all of the arguments that uh, we're probably familiar with uh, from informal discussion, and then if you take university courses about, well, the universe uh, seems to be organized in terms of cause and effect, and uh, so there's all of these orderly patterns that are out in the world, and so we're very scientific in observing what those patterns are. But uh, you know, what are the chances that randomly any of the sophisticated patterns that are extant in the natural world could have arisen? Doesn't it make more sense to say what, where there is an orderly pattern, there must be some sort of intelligent ordering being behind it who imposed the pattern? And so therefore, to the extent that the universe really is quite huge, we must have a high highly intelligent being that organized the whole thing and it also has to be pretty powerful to be able to organize all of the forces of the world. And so QED, we can prove the existence of God and so religion is rational. But notice that what is happening now then in the modern world is that religion is a matter of reasoning. This approach. They say it's not simply a matter of you go to church and you listen to what the priest says and you believe on faith or you read the stories, and those are your bedtime stories, and your Sunday school reading, you believe the stories uncritically on faith. You need to be scientific, rational, proof. That's the game that we play. And that's clearly into the modern world. Now, <clears throat> what interestingly happens, and we're marching through the centuries, is that by the time we get to the Enlightenment, now the 1700s, We've had a couple of centuries of debate between the advocates of faith and the advocates of reason. And those who are on the side of advocating reason, those who want to argue that reason can in fact establish the existence of God versus those who are skeptical, reason cannot establish the existence of God. So we have to abandon that as a failed hypothesis and try to explain the world in naturalistic terms. Now, just journalistically, by the time we get to the 1700s, the age of the Enlightenment, most philosophers and even many theologians are highly skeptical about our ability to prove the existence of God. There are, depending on how you count them, seven major arguments developed over the centuries for the existence of God. And most philosophers, by the time you get to the 1700s, will say those arguments don't work. Right? Don't take it on faith from me. Right? Look at the arguments yourself, but make your judgment. And so what then happens by the time we get into the age of the Enlightenment is most philosophers are willing to say, and including many theologians, religion is an outmoded, primitive belief system. And with modern science and modern reason, we don't need to rely on it anymore. We will have a thoroughly naturalistic understanding of the world. Now what then happens is a counter reaction among the religious then who want to say, look, if it's the case that reason cannot prove the existence of God, but we still think we really need to believe in the existence of God for whatever reasons, to give life meaning, to be a source of moral values and so forth, if reason is not going to get us to God, then what we need to do is reinvigorate some sort of faith. We need to make faith acceptable in the modern world, and that then becomes a very difficult project for more ra ra rational, modern, individualistic, but nonetheless a significant project. Now, I want to mention the name Kant. He's a generation before Kierkegaard here. One of the controversial uh, parts of my uh, history of philosophy analysis, the one that's in the Explaining Postmodernism book, is that I mark Kant as the turning point. Now, in some respects, Immanuel Kant is a man of the Enlightenment. He's a man of reason and so forth, but he does explicitly say uh, at several cases, uh, at several points, that what he wants to do is place limitations on the power of reason. 
that reason is a powerful tool within its limits, but those limits are fairly severe. And in fact, on all of the big questions of life, reason is ultimately empty. He is a skeptic on many fundamental issues, even though to some extent he still is advocating reason. And he announces in his big book, it's called The Critique of Pure Reason, uh, in the preface, uh, the second preface actually to this book, that his purpose is to put limits and show the limitations of reason precisely to leave some space for faith. And so we need to have some sort of faith in the modern world, and so we want to limit reason. Now what then happens is there is the beginnings of a counter-enlightenment, and all of the Enlightenment philosophers, of course, are developing their pro-reason, pro-science epistemologies, math, scientific method, experimental method, statistics, and observational so, and, and developments of, uh, of, of instruments to extend the range of our observational capacities, aided by the Industrial Revolution. All of this is going on, but there's the beginnings of a counter-revolution. If we think that reason is not going to prove the existence of God, and if we think, for example, that then we have to live in a godless and atheist, materialistic kind of world that's then going to be barren of values and meaning, what we then need to do to make faith respectable is not just ask people to you know, go back to be simple-minded medieval peasants and just believe whatever the priests tell you. That's not going to work in the modern world. We need a more sophisticated strategy. We need to go on the offensive against all of the positive claims of the, uh, the, the, the rational epistemology of the Enlightenment. So you find a large number of counter-Enlightenment thinkers who are expending a great deal of energy attacking all of the positive claims of the logical epistemology. So what I want to just do is march through in 40-year chunks. Kant died in 1804, and uh, uh, he's Difficult to read, he's a challenge. You should spend a little bit of time reading some Kant just to, to get some first-hand knowledge. But most historians will tell you that Kant conquered the German intellectual world by the time he had died, and that significantly most of 19th century philosophy and even much of 20th century philosophy is working within a broadly Kantian framework. He's very deep in his, his, uh, his analysis. But by the time we get uh, 40 years later, this is just an indication of where some major currents of European philosophy have gotten. This is Soren Kierkegaard in 1843, um, uh, seen widely as one of the forerunners of existentialist philosophy a very major philosophical movement of the 20th century. They will almost all harken back to Kierkegaard as a formative figure. Perhaps the most influential figure in Protestant theology of the last two centuries. All major Protestant theologians will take their reference from or react to Kierkegaard in some sense. But this is a bit of a reflection uh, or uh, some excerpts from uh, Kierkegaard's reflection on the story of Abraham. Uh, the one that we just went through. And what he wants to argue is, <clears throat> in addition to all of his arguments about why enlightenment reason he thinks doesn't work, that if you are going to be a man of faith in the modern world, you have to recognize that religion, particularly Christianity, is an absurd belief system. It doesn't make any sense. That is totally a mistake to try to say that you can give a good argument for the existence of God, and that all of the specific tenets of Christianity, virgin births, right, uh, uh, water turning into wine, bread turning into the body of Jesus, resurrections, miracles, this, that, and the other thing, God uh, being one, but at the same time being three, right? God is uh, infinite and out of time, but Jesus is also God, and he's physical and in time, but they're really the same thing, and there's also the Holy Ghost floating around. Kierkegaard's point is, you can't make sense of that. It doesn't make sense. It is an irrational belief system, but if we're going to have a meaningful life, you have to commit to something, and this is, in his bones, he thinks, the right thing to commit to, and so what it means is, in order, as a human being, born in the modern world, who's been trained to have some respect for reason, you have to realize reason is your enemy. You have to crucify it, right? kill it. And then that's going to put you in a position to be able to make the leap into the absurd. 
and precisely why he says the most important story in all of human history is the story of Abraham is precisely for that point, because what did Abraham do? He had all of these questions, all of these rational questions. He stifled those questions, and he was willing to kill on the basis of his faith. And that seemed like an absurd killing, but he was willing to do so. All right, that is post-Enlightenment, anti-Enlightenment thinking, 1840s. By the time we get to the 1880s, this is an excerpt, excerpt from Friedrich Nietzsche, the most important philosopher by far to understanding what's going on in the 20th century. If you've not read some Nietzsche, spend some time with Nietzsche. He's a very dramatic, very exciting author, but also in terms of the questions he's raising, extraordinarily powerful. And one of the striking things about Nietzsche is the range of people who are influenced by him. Strong theists, strong atheists. He has harsh things to say about Jews and Christians, but a huge number of Christians and Jews will find inspiration in, in Nietzsche. People on the political left, on the political right, liberals, authoritarians, his influence is everywhere. You have to know something about Nietzsche. And what Nietzsche, of course, is famous for was the earlier God is dead phase, but what do we then do? Rather than, in contrast to Nietzsche, or sorry, in contrast to Kierkegaard, just take an absurd leap of faith into a religious system, what Nietzsche is going to argue is a much more secularized, naturalistic version. Reason, from his perspective, is just kind of a Johnny-come-lately evolutionary thing, where instead what we have to understand is that we come out of a long evolutionary line, we're animals, we're predators at the top of the food chain, and we all have instincts and drives within us to varying degrees, but rather than relying on this, you know, you know, evolutionary late rational capacity, which as he describes is pitiful, shadowy and fleeting, aimless and capricious, that's what the human intellect is. If you're gonna have a vital life, it's going to be passion and commitment that one will drive to. Again, anti-enlightenment. By the time we jump another 40 years, we're now into the 1920s, Martin Heidegger, mentioned him earlier. Uh, he's dealing with a metaphysical question, trying to figure out whether the universe, uh, there's a reason, why, why are we all here? Why does the universe exist? You know, if we want to say, well, there's no reason why the universe exists, it's just here. Well, then we're saying that the universe's existence is just this irrational brute fact. On the other hand, if we say the universe is here for a cause, and we start to say things like, well, the universe is everything that exists, and so if the universe came into existence, it must have come out of nothing, but then we try to say, well, what is it to say that the universe came into existence out of nothing? And that seems kind of absurd, irrational, I can't make sense of that. So either we say it's just here, there's no reason why it's here, or we have to give this absurdist answer that it came. So the point is then he is saying is that you know, if we start to think and try to think too hard with our weak intellect about these really important metaphysical questions, we just end up in contradictions and absurdity again. But he's happy about that. If this contradiction right, breaks the sovereignty of reason, and of course what we know about the Enlightenment thinkers is the sovereignty of reason. Right? Hold reason primary. Don't ever be irrational. Then the fate of the rule of logic is also decided. So we dispense with reason, we're also going to dispense with logic. Logic disintegrates in the vortex of a more original question. So if we're really going to do philosophy appropriately, it's not fundamentally going to be by reason. Now this is now to set up for the postmodernists because now we are into the 1920s and all of the postmoderns with one exception are first generation major league postmoderns are born in the 1920s. One was born Richard Rorty in 1931. Foucault, Derrida, Lyotard, Rorty, the big four, all born of this generation. So this is the philosophical world that they are now being born into. Now here we have a leading logical positivist, as we call him, or it's Schlick. Well, what are the tools of reason? Well, one of the tools of reason is, of course, language. Right? And the point here is going to be, as well, language doesn't map onto the way the world is. We just make languages up. The rules of language are, in principle, arbitrary. Okay? So if we're following linguistic structures, and those linguistic structures are arbitrary, they're not going to be helpful at getting some sort of objective fact about the way the world actually is. This is the early Wittgenstein uh, uh, from his Tractatus. All propositions of logic say the same thing. 
That is nothing. So logic is a completely empty science. So the idea that somehow we can take all of these facts about the world and organize them logically and prove things, well, that's an emptiness, right? Logic is not something that enables us to do so. A.J. Ayer, another, uh, uh, toward, uh, this is now in the 1930s though, with his language, truth, and logic, a very smart Oxford philosopher, but making the argument of principles of logic and mathematics are true universally. Okay, sure, fine. So now we're adding mathematics to it, but uh, what makes those true? It's not any sort of objective, logical, or mathematical structure built into the universe. Instead, we never allow them to be anything else. Logic and mathematics on this view are matters of subjective definition, subjective uh, convention, subjective commitments. We decided that we're just going to make these universally true. So it's a subjective imposition on the world, and we can't say anything about the way the world is. So the point of all of this, and there's arguments behind this, of course, but language, logic, mathematics, those are all things that the Enlightenment said are going to bring in genuine knowledge that science is a magnificent progressive project. Here, it's all undercut. Philosophy is into an extraordinarily skeptical phase. Hence, the quotation we saw earlier today, ultimately, reason, truth, and knowledge, it's, it's meaningless. Yeah? We don't think we can ground any of those things. So postmoderns are on their way. Truth is, well, it's not out there. And now we integrate the last session's material. Right? Where do we get our ideas, our beliefs, our values, our convictions from? Our groups, our collectives, and so forth. And so we're just born into societies. They have languages. They have conventions. And we have to play the game according to our social grouping. So truth, yeah, if we're not going to then say it comes from God or it comes from the natural world, it's going to be, well, you know, do your contemporaries say it, that's okay, you can say that, you can believe that. And so we socialize our understanding of knowledge. So now what we then have is a three-way debate. Is truth based on knowledge of what God is and wants? Is truth based on the way the world is and objective facts that are independent of what we want to be true? Or is truth a social construct? that we participate in only to the extent that we subjectively commit to our group's way of doing things. Now what this then means is uh, uh, language is explicitly seen as a tool of social manipulation. Right? It's not the case that there are right, divinely underscored meanings for concepts. And that what you need to do is get the language right. And if you think of all of those biblical scholars who are very concerned, what does God mean by this? And we have to get it right. Or the very careful, careful definitions and distinctions and taxonomical schemes that scientists will use when they're trying to parse out the way nature works. It's important to get the language right. And we need to define our terms and have sharp categories when the sharp categories are necessary. Instead, if language is something that we make up socially and we use socially and it's a tool of social getting alongness in order to be a part of the group, what we then have to do is be sensitive to what the group is making up. But of course, we're allowed to enter into the fray. And what language is, is of course, it has some effect on other people. We mutually influence each other, but not in terms of re-referencing objective facts. So manipulation, rhetorical, meaning becomes much more important. And then we start to be familiar with why it is so difficult and often frustrating to try to have arguments with postmodernists because there often are established meanings or scientifically approved meanings or meanings that you think are, 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 are accurate representations of the way words should be used. But if that word does not suit the rhetorical purpose of the postmodern you're arguing with, they will use a concept and shift it or slift it or on many cases obvert or subvert its meaning in order to, uh, to, to achieve a certain end. So some of the examples here are, you know, disagreement in the modern tradition is to be prized because 
We all have our own minds, and of course it's through the collision of ideas, let the better argument prevail. And so disagreement is sometimes unpleasant, but we should go for it. In this case, uh, disagreement can only mean that you're not in the group. Right? You haven't committed right already. And so what we do find then is, uh, particularly with nice liberal people who believe in civility and so forth, if you can say what you're really doing is hate speech, you're arguing against some group who has a different framework, you should not be doing that. That's attacking, stop doing that. Argument right then becomes violence. The foundational modern distinction between uh, uh, speech and act, right? Uh, you know, sticks and stones and all of that and the various interpretations of that. But free speech, say what you want as firmly, as harshly as you want, but don't coerce the other person. That's, that's fine. Once you go into physical coercion, that's where we draw the line. You can't do that. That's the modern liberal position. At this point, there is no distinction between speech and act. Instead, it's all part of a continuum. And so if you are speaking against a person harshly, there's no difference between that and attacking a person harshly, particularly rather if you are a person of greater power. Right? Your words are coercive with respect to those who are relatively disempowered. And the assumption there is that they don't have an independent individual strength of mind in order to be able to think for themselves and resist the power play that goes on. One of my uh, favorite ones is uh, an evolution I've noticed over the course of the last 30 years, and it's quite interesting. So we have for a long time had concerns and debates about poverty. We don't want people to be poor. But what is the cause of poverty? And even just to phrase the question that way is already to speak the scientific language. Poverty is the effect, and there are certain causes, and we should be able to figure out what the causes are. And then as modern progressive thinking people, we think we should be able to address those root causes and solve the problem of poverty. But we need to make sure that we get the causes right. And typically then we say things like, well, there's lots of different causes. Sometimes people are just born into it, right? Or they make stupid decisions, right? Or they are, they are lazy or natural disasters happened to them and so forth. And so we have all of these multi-causal analysis. But what was interesting was about 30 to 40 years ago it happened where there was a conscious move to replace the word poverty, not to use the word poverty, but to describe the poor as underprivileged. Right? And those of you who are a little bit older might be able to remember when this shift occurred. The poor are underprivileged. And that is already then a shift in the language game. So we're not going to use this old-fashioned word because there's a whole taxonomy of, uh, of, of understanding that's built into that, we're going to say it's un underprivileged. But what is it to say that the poor people are underprivileged? The reason that they are poor is society, right, everything is now social and communal, has not granted to them a privilege. Right. And then the flip side of that, and this is the one coming on in this generation, is privilege. And you've probably noticed in the last five years a dramatic uptick in the use of privilege. Everything is a privilege, but what privilege means is any advantage that anybody has is a privilege. But what's a privilege? Well, a privilege, again, is something that someone in a higher position of authority grants to you. It's a social sanction of a certain sort of action. So already we're using and shifting the language in a direction that presupposes a postmodern framework. Okay, so language games and the rhetorical use of language, but a different understanding of what language is all about. Language is not understood by the postmoderns as a tool of objectivity. Rather, it is a social power game that we're all engaged in trying to influence each other. And this then uh, connects up with a question that was raised earlier. This then applies all the way by the time we get to science. Right? Science is not an objective understanding of the way the world works. Rather, in this case, science comes out of a particular group's way of thinking. The male way of thinking, by and large, uh, this is not necessarily a racial version. It's, for some, it's going to be white male right, way of thinking. But in this case, it's just a male way of thinking. And what do, uh, what do men want to do? Well, men are thinking about sex all of the time. right? They want to penetrate nature's secrets, and they and, uh, and do this, that, and the other thing. So clearly, uh, uh, science is just a male enterprise, but male have more, males have more power than females do, and they want females to think the way that they do, and they're imposing their scientific agenda on women who are 
a different group with a different way of communicating, a different way of understanding the world. And so science should not be universal and imperialistic. Okay, I rushed through that a little bit because uh, I want to make sure that we're able to touch on all the topics that I do, but I want to stop at that point and take some questions, any questions that you have on these epistemological and cognitive issues. So uh, Sam and uh, the microphone people, where are we? So questions that you have, let's, uh, let's have at that. After lunch digestion is also happening. Yes, okay. All right, good. Uh, you know, here comes the microphone, gentleman at the back. So we uh, then have a three-way debate over faith, reason, and kind of social rhetorical manipulation as what knowledge is all about. Hello? Our guy there. Yes, yeah, Stephen. Good. Um, Michael here. Um, just, I guess, thinking about this session, how is it that these postmodern ideas have really become, you know, so so dominant when they're, I, I guess, a little bit um, crazy? And <laughs> second, secondly, um, I'm. You know, the two, you know, huge events of the 20th century, the First and Second World Wars, haven't featured that much in, in what you've said. I'm just wondering if you could reflect on, on the influence of those events a bit. Yeah, so that's two questions. One is, how could they become so prevalent generically? And then the second is, uh, do the major existential events of the 20th century feed into them? And yeah, we might also add Great Depression and so Holocaust and, and, and other reflections there as well. Uh, well, the first one is, um, I do think it's true of the first generation postmodern that they are true believer skeptics in the sense that it is important that Rorty is a PhD philosopher and he spent decades in the trenches doing analytic philosophy. And when you read his philosophy in the mirror of nature, you see him going through all of the increasingly skeptical moves systematically. So I think he is in a position of just saying, look, I'm, I'm not coming to this initially motivated by religious fervor. I just want to believe whatever it is that I believe. I really think that we've tried reason. It doesn't work. And so the question is what we're going to do next. And so to, to some extent, among smart people who are willing to do the history of philosophy, a certain number of them will become uh, uh, postmodern in this limited epistemological sense. They will just be skeptics as a, as a, as a matter of principle. Uh, if you then want to ask about the, the postmodernists who want to apply this to human relations, to values, to politics, to science, and so forth, I think you have to add other elements in those cases. Now, I do think it's also important, though, uh, in the case of someone like um, um, Derrida, Foucault, and Lyotard, where uh, the politics is more important to them, one way of uh, thinking about this that I think is absolutely important is that when you get to the 1950s, and this will start to connect with your uh, world history situation, is that in addition to being philosophers who got PhDs doing a lot of epistemology at very good universities knowing the state of art, that all of these guys were committed as young people to very far left politics. So uh, just to quickly recap right on that one, right, Foucault joined the French Communist Party in 1953. He left a few years later, but that says something. Late 1960s, Maoism is on the rise in China, and for many Western leftists, China is the sexy new version of socialism. And Foucault declares himself as a kind of Maoist uh, in the late 1960s. Interestingly, also in 1979, when the theocratic revolution happened in Iran, now you might think, wow, old style theocrats, right, is of the Islamic version, insisting on an absolutist interpretation of the Quran and willing to impose that by authoritarian methods. That's about as far as 
atheist left-wing postmodernism as you can possibly get. But nonetheless, Foucault expresses admiration for what is going on in Iran under the Ayatollahs. So there's a kind of a long streak of authoritarianism, but the common denominator is a political opposition to anything that smacks of liberalism, uh, 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 parliamentary democracy, uh, and the Western style of doing po politics in that particular way. So you might then say, um, actually I want to say one more thing before I get to the, you might then say, Lyotard, uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard was a Trotskyite. Uh, he hung out and published with a group called Socialism or Barbarism. That was th their name. It was either so socialism as the wave of the future or or just end up becoming barbarism or uh, barbarians. And Derrida hung out with French communists and published in their journals and was sympathetic to their cause. And I believe I had a quotation earlier in the day where Derrida was saying, we need something now in the spirit of Marxism. Now, this is in the 1950s and the 1960s, and the spirit of Marxism is important because the 1950s were a disaster for the far left, particularly the Marxist far left, because the Communist Manifesto had been published in 1848, Marx and his co-author Engels. And it's a, in some ways, you might say it's an enlightenment kind of project because it says, you know, the world is materialistic and there's cause and effect and we can figure out all the stages that humanity is going to go through and we can figure out all of the conflicts and necessarily there are certain economic things that are going to happen in capitalism. The rich will get richer, the poor will get poorer because of competition and then a monopolization of the political process. And at a certain point, it makes sense psychologically to say the oppressed masses just aren't going to take it anymore because their wages have been driven down to subsistence level, but they'll realize that they have vast numbers on their half that the, uh, the exploiting rich guys are just a few numbers, so they have the ability to rise up, smash their exploiters, take over the government, and after a period of dictatorship, communism will arise. Now, that then is to say, if you believe in classical Marxism, you don't really actually have to do something, because Marx said this was going to happen as a kind of necessary process. So by the time, though, you get to the 1950s, how long has it been since the Communist Manifesto? Right? It's over a century. And usually at the century mark, people start <laughs> paying attention. They say, hmm, we've been waiting for the revolution to materialize for a century, and it hasn't happened. Okay? And of course, at various points, they're looking for various economics indicators. Oh, there's a crisis in the 1880s. There's a little depression here. There's a recession there. Capitalism is finished. Capitalism is finished. And they keep making these predictions. But after you've made predictions six times, you start to feel a little foolish. Right, saying, oh, this time for real, it's going to happen, right? Then you start sounding like religious apocalyptics, right, who have been for 2,000 years saying, oh, Judgment Day is coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. So what we then have in the far left is a realize that the revolution is not happening, and that's a crisis. So that then seems to indicate that Marx's predictions, as scientific as they are, and it's interesting that Marx also called his socialism scientific socialism, so this seems to be a scientific theory that is failing, and we're going to say some more things about that in the next section. But then there's a kind of crisis of faith. So what are we going to do with our commitment to a belief in some kind of socialism if we don't think the classical model is working? So what I'm going to uh, be arguing, and I think we'll flesh this out a little bit later, though, is that uh, what you have is people who are skeptics when it turns to epistemological matters. And they're convinced that skepticism of some sort is, is correct. So maybe Marx was too optimistic to think that he could scientifically predict the way society was going to go. But at the same time, even though socialism of the form that they want to have, have happened has not happened, they still have a commitment to socialism. And so we're looking for different tactics to bring it about. And then it becomes a numbers game. By the time you uh, get to the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, and the 1950s, the demographics among intellectuals in the West is that a significant number of them are on the left, on the far left, and they believe that in some sort of Marxism is the wave of the future. So they're uh, in important uh, positions, and so they're able to perpetuate themselves. So something like that is to wave my hands at, at the beginnings of an explanation. 
Uh, thank you. Um, I, I, I'm so far with you in all this is ridiculous, but the question still is, and in fact, I think it was part of what was the advertised, that uh, how do you argue with these people? What yes. is the actual technique? If I, I, I deal with people all the time who are on the green revolution and the green, green side up or whatever, and it, it drives me may, <clears throat> mad because they, there are no facts, there are no issues you can actually deal with them over. They, they, they tell you things. I'll tell you about islands sinking in the Pacific or whatever. They have things you've, you, if you've heard about them, you can only vaguely remember what. How do you argue with a okay. postmodernist? Because it is not just in philosophy schools, it's everywhere. Right. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I find that I'm always dealing with people who seem mad to me. <laughs> okay. Well, unfortunately, the, the short answer to your question, and it's, a, it's an important question, is you can't argue with postmodernists if you're talking with a committed postmodernist, because on principle, they don't believe in argumentation. For them, it's a matter of rhetorical manipulation, rhetorical influence. They don't believe in argument all the way down. So the healthy thing always to do whenever you're having an argument with anybody is, do you believe in facts? Do you believe in logic? And if the answer is no, then whatever it is that you do with that person should not proceed on the basis of, of argument and reason. Instead, if the person says yes and they seem to be genuine, then you can have a productive debate and so forth. So there has to be that, that shared common ground. So what I typically do, though, is uh, um, say that if you find yourself, though, in any sort of a public forum and you're dealing with someone who's a postmodernist, that person is not your audience. Right? That person is a foil. Right, or, or a chance for you to get your arguments out. Because, well, yes, there are lots of postmoderns and they're everywhere. There are still lots of people, particularly young people, who are open to fact, open to argumentation. And in most cases, if it's shown that you've got a good case to make, they will hear that case. If the other person ultimately is babbling and or saying ridiculous things and or obviously engaged in you know, paradoxical formulations and so on, that won't stick your, your argument will prevail. The longer term thing is, uh, to say, the sort of things that we're doing today. All of the arguments that led the, the postmodernists to be so skeptical, uh, so relativistic, so subjectivistic in the corrupted sense and so forth, we have to know what all of those arguments are. And this is the John Stuart Mill thing. We have to understand what were the weaknesses of the Enlightenment project? What were the legitimate criticisms that were raised? How did we get to where we are right now? Uh, so that we are up to speed on what all of the arguments are. And at that point, we're in a position to say, these are the important arguments that need to be addressed. And if, in fact, there are skeptical arguments that can be addressed against uh, reason or, 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 or individualism right, or, or whatever, uh, the idea of universal rights, we have to know what those arguments are. So in that sense, uh, as frustrating as this generation is, we can see the postmoderns as doing us a certain kind of favor, because to the extent that they have arguments that seem to have traction, uh, if we find ourselves, I don't understand that argument, well, that means we have some learning to do. So that's an argument we need to pay attention to, because it has some traction with some people, and we need to know how to respond to it. I'm sorry? Haven't the left been using the attack tactic of going... Sorry for butting uh, in there. There we are. Um, have the left been using that tactic for years now, like going on to, say, right-wing shows and all that, and even though they might only get maybe 1% of that audience, haven't they been using that exact tactic? Well, yes. Uh, you can say that the tactic goes all the way back to Marx in the 1800s because it is one of the implications that if you think people are born into different economic classes and the class that you are born into shapes your worldview, including your values, including what you think is true and foundational, uh, then different groups are going to always be speaking past each other. And so the Marxists will very quickly say, it is important, uh, 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 impossible to argue with people. And if you identify an argument coming from a different part of the political spectrum, what you then just do is to say, oh, that's a rich person's argument, right? Or that's an argument made by a property, or you're only saying that because, and then they point out some 
feature of your, your, uh, your biography. So yes, everything becomes ad hominem, and that is an old tactic going back to the Marxists. But in even earlier, we haven't talked about him yet, there's a, a kind of a non-Marxist version of socialism that goes back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and he's usually seen as the first counter-enlightenment figure. Uh, arguing that reason is, uh, is, 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 a, is, is, a, is a poor fac uh, faculty and that passions are much more important. Uh, uh, and so uh, you know, the Rousseauians also will argue that socialism should be advocated from a, from a, from a more passionate perspective and they will de-emphasize arguments. So you're right, in the modern world, the left has not been strong on argumentation and they've been very quick when they get into trouble to abandon argumentation and to resort to more direct facts. And I don't think it's an accident that aside from ethnic nationalists, if you, just, if you talk about violence, uh, the, the uh, ethnic violence and some amount of religious violence is very important, and those are all people who've given up on reason, is that uh, the, the most violent terrorist groups uh, are also significantly populated by far left political groups, and the epistemology is part and parcel of their activism. They just think, Appealing to reason, appealing to democracy, appealing to uh, civility and so forth, that is all just completely pointless. It's only going to be forceful, violent, revolutionary action that's going to bring about the kind of change that they think is possible. So, that's harsh but sad. Uh, I don't know who has the mic now. Okay, go ahead. Hey, Stephen, Noah here. Um, before you spoke about group identity, and I was just wondering uh, on your thoughts on whether, um, to what aspect uh, group identity is conditioned, socially engineered into us, and what may be biological, like we're born with that sort of um, group identity, like in terms of uh, how we identify with others, uh, like ethnicity, um, you know, we see the LGBT stuff now, you know, uh, gender, you know, that sort of stuff. Right, yeah. Well, I want to say uh, to a large extent, I should as a philosopher remain agnostic on that. So if you want to you know, raise the question, to what extent is it the case that biologically personality differences are built into us? So you might say, here's a, so a person who's quick to anger, right? and here's a person who's regularly calm and is, uh, takes a lot for that person to, uh, to get angry, right, and so forth. And from my perspective, I'm, I'm open to either argument. You might then want to say, well, you know, we all have the capacity for anger. If we think that something a wrong has been done to us, there will be psychological and physical processes that happen. And some of those are biochemical, right? Certain biochemicals are, are secreted or released into the system. It might very well be as a matter of biological nature. When that happens, some people, they get a lot of that chemical released into them, and so they're quick to anger, whereas for other people, as a biological factor, the release of that chemical is slower, and so they are slower to anger. And of course, it can also be that uh, people learn, right? You're raised in, as I, <laughs> uh, British American culture. Uh, you are taught at a very early age to stifle your emotions, including uh, uh, your, uh, your emotions of anger. And so people who are born in that culture will be more slower to manifest their anger, whereas people raised in other cultures where you know, you're expected to let your emotions out, they will be quicker to anger. So I think the proper posture for me is to say I'm agnostic on, on those issues. That's just personality issues. And I think the same thing also should be with respect to sexuality, right? Whether uh, uh, your sexual orientation is uh, largely biological, largely environmental, some mixture of the two. I, I don't think a philosopher sitting in his or her armchair is in a position to pronounce on that. As for ethnicity, I think I am in a position on, on ethnicity because uh, the, the empirical data seems pretty obvious that ethnicity is learned. Right? So uh, you know, if, if by ethnicity you mean your language, the way you dress, your, your, your religious attitudes, the language you speak, and so forth. I think all the data seems to show that you can take a newborn baby and adopt that up baby out to pretty much anywhere in the world, and the resulting baby grown to adulthood will dress and speak and, uh, and be starting from a cultural base depending on the ethnicity in which they are, they are raised. So um, agnosticism, but 
turning it over to the appropriate scientific expertises in each of those areas. Now, I don't think I spoke to all of the points, but is that enough for now? Yes. Okay. Hi, Dr. Hicks. Um, Hi. I just have a working hypothesis and just wanted to get your thoughts on it. Ah, thank you. Um, just observe the pattern, and you're mentioning right here about postmodernism, and they began in 1920, so most of the generation is kind of dead. And you could make the argument this generation began out of a pursuit of creating something radically different, just out of a perspective of in order to be famous as a philosopher, you've got to take a radical position on an issue if you want to be noticed. The standard classical position is kind of boring and you get passed by. So you had a lot of radical professors trying to push the logic to its ultimate extreme, yep. go into a total yeah, There's a lot to that hypothesis. I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. Now, second generation is, which we are in today, or maybe third generation, is not based so much on following the logic of this argument. Scott Peck had an interesting argument. He's a psychiatrist, and he mentioned the point that the original sin is not pride or any other of those seven sins that are classically defined as sins. But he said that in every human being, he observes there's a condition of laziness. From a baby to a fully grown man to a dying man, we are all lazy by nature. So new postmodernism seems to me that it's a form of laziness in terms of thinking because if you want to be a good, I mean, if you want to have a good job and you're lazy about it, you could become a philosopher in postmodernism, gender studies. You don't need to be very smart. You could probably get away with an IQ of 120. Your salary would be exactly the same as a quantum physicist, a, a um, professor in medicine, anything that you want. You could go to the next level and become part of the administration. I just learned recently that at the uh, University of California, the vice chancellor is getting paid 600 and something thousand dollars per year to do this kind of diversity training in University of California. And there's 21 members in the staff. That's a good gig, huh? Absolutely. That's $100,000 more than the Australian Prime Minister. Mm. And that's one university. Yeah. So at the moment, it seems like this, this is actually driven by economics. The universities are cashing in so much. You don't have to be smart. I just play along with the games. All I need to do, I know the answers. Men are bad, uh, heterosexuals are bad, whites are bad. I just go with those so answers it's right up a good Postmodernism point. bingo, you know all of yeah, the right. Yeah, absolutely. Boom, boom, just, boom, 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 catchphrases. The, yeah. the answer is already set. Everyone, all your peer reviews will agree with you. You will yes. get your PhD. You don't have to be very smart. In fact, okay. can't anyone read right. that? Good. So, uh, hypothesis then is. First generation, maybe something significant to it, but there is a natural dynamic for academics, especially to push things to the extremes. So that's explains second and perhaps third generation uh, in that dynamic. And the second uh, hypothesis is that it's just careerism. There's always in any field, but especially in the academic world, a significant number of second rate minds and third rate minds. And it's a cushy lifestyle. You get the summers off, you get a nice salary, not much market feedback and, <laughs> and accountability. So uh, if you want to have a certain kind of lifestyle, then you can just get your union card, so to speak. And to get your union card, you learn how to say all of the right things and you can, uh, you can go for it. Now, I, uh, I, I think that's, that, that's, that's true. Uh, for a certain number of postmoderns, and uh, when you read a certain amount of the literature, you have to, it doesn't take very long before you realize that you're just reading the same old stuff that you read 10 years ago, right, or 15 years ago. So there's a certain amount of retreading that goes on, and then you say, well, why would these people be retreading and restating stuff that they know has been worked to death in the previous generation? And the only explanation then seems to be, well, they're intellectually lazy, or they're intellectually without ambition. They're just putting in time until they, they, get, their, they get their career. So I think those kinds of sociological explanations can go a long way to explaining the persistence of any movement that succeeds in capturing institutions. We're still left, though, with the question of how that institution got captured by that particular viewpoint, particularly if it seems like it's a crazy and uh, a set of uh, ideas and one that seems to be designed perhaps for some disturbed individuals and or lazy 
people as well. So I think you would have to go back to saying the first rate people, uh, they're the ones who did the capturing and we have to take their arguments seriously. Now I do want to take issue with uh, one thing that you said though, that I don't think that human beings are by nature lazy. Uh, I think laziness is, is a, I'm sorry? Uh, oh, this is somebody else's it's argument. Not, okay. So, so I would a take, psychiatrist. Yeah, got it. So, so, so he wrote well, the book, um, The Pathless Travel. Fair enough. Familiar. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. So whoever makes the argument that humans are by nature lazy, no, I don't think that's true. I think the exact opposite is true. I think anyone who has take, seen children, their children are naturally energetic, curiosity, or you put so them in a... Intellectual laziness is the foundational one, not actual physical. Most people like to do a lot of... Stuff. Yeah, no, that's, there's a mind-body integration here. Kids are curious. They... Uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, the, uh, the kids that I'm aware of at this age group, they just why, 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 why? They, they want the explanation all the way, all the way down. Uh, they're, they're voracious. I think the opposite is uh, uh, kids are naturally athletes, naturally you know, genius potential, and what we do is we stunt them, and we teach them not to do uh, various things. Okay. <laughs> Last question. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stephen. Um, I've got, uh, just a, if I may, a very brief comment on the um, Abraham and Isaac uh, story with regard to faith and reason, then a quick question. Um, it does say uh, in the New Testament that Abraham reasoned that God was able to raise Isaac. And so I would say it was a marrying of faith and reason. Yeah. He reasoned that God was able to do it. And he had faith in the goodness of God, that God was just so God wouldn't just let him die. So the fact yeah. is that it was faith in a good God. He reasoned, therefore, that God was able to raise him. So right, this was a, a, a marrying of reason and faith, which I think is actually throughout, if, you know, you can see throughout. And um, so okay, he just trusted. Uh, speak to that and then we'll go to the... Next yeah, yeah. Thing. So, yeah, this is a, a mainstream, more moderate interpretation of the Abraham story, right, that you are you're yeah. offering here. Um, but you'll, then you'll notice, though, that, that it takes the bite out of faith as a virtue. Because then what you have to do is to say, for Abraham to be a good person, he has to go through a certain process of reason. And to the extent that he goes through the process of reason, he's not a man of faith. No, I would uh, so faith. That. Yeah, so faith. Well, I'm just saying that's, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's the response to that interpretation. But uh, even to the extent that if you go through the process of reason and you say, I believe that God in his goodness must have some reason or other for this, if you don't understand what that reason is, then you are still deferring your responsibility to know why you're doing what you're doing to a higher authority that still would be a faith move, um, and to the extent that you think people should act only on the basis of their own understanding, it's a, a moral responsibility abdication. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I, I don't totally disagree. I think it's also sure. a matter of trust. He trusted, like, uh, without understanding, uh, like, my, my, I might yeah. not understand what my husband okay. does, yeah. so okay. but this I is, have this, faith in him that's that right. he will but do the is, right this thing. This is a great issue. This is a great issue. So, so, so take, oh, let me just come back on that trust. one. So you got your husband there, but just put it in this perspective. Suppose your <laughs> husband comes to you and says, I want you to take our son out into the backyard and, right. and now you might say, I've known my husband for years. He's a good guy. He's probably got I'll his I'll say reason. he's got a plan B because I know him. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I know he's got a plan B. That's got a, right. I, but what it is, it's talking right. about a particular type of trust. Or would you say, no freaking way <laughs> <laughs> well, probably I I'll tell to him to that. where to get yeah, off, you know. Right. That, so good, personalize it. Yeah, okay, but okay. then your follow-up. But look, the, the point that I was talking about trust was is that we often hear politicians say that public trust is at, at an all-time low. And I think that is absolutely true. And I think it's absolutely true because people, well, this is my, and I'm asking, do you think it's true? Because people don't know what to believe anymore. What's true 
we don't know what's true. We've got, you know, we have so many stories. Everyone gets up and says, my story, my story, my story. There's not a grand narrative that anybody believes in. Yeah. And so we've all got, um, you know, Confucius said, when words lose their meaning, people lose their freedom. And we see the erosion of freedoms day after day after day because we all have to have our own little special spaces which necessarily discriminates against someone else in the name of inclusion. So all this sort of stuff, is this the whole consequence of postmodernism? Yeah. I wouldn't say all of it is a consequence of postmodernism, no, not by a long shot. Um, uh, faith in, say, government officials and people in positions of power, that's a long-standing condition right in the modern world. It goes up and down by the cross of the generations. And part of that is, uh, part of that is healthy. Uh, you see a lot of corruption that goes on there, and that should undercut. You see, in many cases, uh, people in positions of power, they said that they had things figured out, but they were just plain wrong. And so history starts to teach you that you probably shouldn't just have faith and so forth. And so I think uh, that realization, distrusting people, is, is healthy. You should be healthily skeptical until those people have proved their, their position. But I think postmodernism has uh, had its uh, effect over the course of the last generation because younger people, by the time they leave high school and certainly by the time they leave university, they are less prepared for the world. And that's, uh, that's a result of uh, uh, all of the things that we've been talking about today. If you don't think the mind and objectivity and argumentation and taking science seriously uh, are, are, are important, you're not going to spend a whole lot of time. And so by the time you've got kids who are 18, 20, 22 years old, they, uh, you know, they have their educational certification, but they're not yet educated. At the same time, we're developing an increasingly complicated world. And so we're putting them out into a complicated world. And they're not stupid in the sense that they realize how complicated the world is, but at the same time, inside, they realize they're not ready to take it on. And so that is a, that's a difficult place. It's very frustrating. Uh, and people, of course, will react. Sometimes they will just withdraw from everything, just go into a shell. Others will, uh, will, will say, I, you know, I need to just then just try something and do something irrational. Or some of them will sense that uh, they've been sold a packaged goods, a raw deal, uh, they're putting, being put into a complicated system that is already corrupted and that will make them angry. And so a certain amount of the activism I think is, uh, is appropriate on the basis of that and at least psychologically understandable. And that, All right, next and break. And that concludes the third session. Please thank Professor Stevens. Okay. Good.